Hey. <laughs> hey, my name's Tim. I'm the pastor here, and I get the pleasure of talking about sex today. So, um, so is everybody ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, two of you and some of you laughing still. All right. Um, hey, you know, when we talk about, this is a very sensitive subject that we're talking about today, and, and there's emotions and understanding and personal views all over the charts in this room. And even those of you who join us online and know as you're listening, um, you're going to be coming to this, this conversation with, with a lens that you're already looking through. And so, um, so we're going to get there, but, uh, but let me start the conversation this way, because I want to talk about New Hope first. I want to talk about the church and what it should be, okay? Um, now, I don't know if you've ever been to a job interview, uh, and, and you've been hoping to get a job, and you have to show up to that final meeting and appointment that you have with the boss, and you're in the room that is right before you get to see that, that waiting room. What is going on inside of you in the waiting room for a job interview, Right? Uh, it's probably like some worries and some like fear and you, you probably dress pretty nicely you took a shower and smell good and are eating a mint at, before you go in right like you've prepared yourself because you need to put on your best front you got to put on the best face and you got to be ready when you get into that interview that it's all going to be okay right that 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 uh, that you're going to show your best self in front of that boss or the person that has a decision to hire you or not hire you and what's next right and so waiting in that waiting room can be an anxious one um, and, and it can also be one that, that you hope you have your best game ready, right? Your, your best face on and ready to go. Now, I'm going to talk about a different wait, waiting room, though. I don't know if you've ever had to be in a doctor's waiting room before. It's a different experience, isn't it? Because <laughs> when you're, you're in a waiting room full of a bunch of other people who you know are there because they're sick, right? <laughs> like They're there because they have a temperature or a fever or something's going on in their body, and they're going to be going not for an interview. They're going to hopefully have somebody who can help them Somebody who can give them an answer and some medicine or some next steps to figure out how can I get better. And, uh, and so your attitude going to a doctor's appointment or like going to the ER or urgent care is usually a little different because when you're going to the ER and you're sick, you're usually not dressed to the nines, right? <laughs> you're usually not. Sometimes it's pajama time because that's what, when it happened. You know, this is where I'm at and I'm in the doctor's office. And the thing is when you show up there, everybody else looks at you and go, wow, they must be really, really sick. And, and so they accept like, Welcome to the waiting room. We're all here together. And, uh, and even when you're in that waiting room, you look at other people and be like, so what are you here for? You know, like, like you can have conversations. You're like, you're sick. I'm, what, what, you know, why are you seeing the doctor? Because we all realize we're in that room to go see somebody who can hopefully help us. Now, now I want to take those two waiting rooms and equate them to church. Because so often the church has felt way more like, and I'm saying in general, way more like you're in that waiting room for an interview and you come to church trying to put your best face on, trying to say, okay, I hope they accept me. I hope everything, everything works out and they don't, they don't see who I really am, but this is who I want to portray so I can be accepted and get the job, right? And that's what many churches have been. I'm going to tell you here at New Hope, welcome to the doctor's office. Because we're all looking around and we all know we're all sick. <laughs> we all got issues. We all got brokenness. We all have pain. We all have hurts. And, and the topic we're talking about today, uh, no doubt in this room with all the different views, experiences, and things we've all been through, we are coming with wounds, hurts, pain, and, and, uh, and, and we're coming to a good physician, a doctor who knows where we've been, what we've been through, the things we've experienced with our sexuality, and, and here at New Hope, we're all in this together. And so what I'm saying here is this is a place, an environment, and a church that says we love everybody right where you're at. We wear the shirt boldly. No perfect people allowed. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And so as I talk about this, as I'm going to be talking about sex and sexuality, we got to cover it with that understanding of where we're at, who we are as a church, and some of you guys see some new faces even. Welcome. We're glad you're here um, for this conversation, um, that, that we want to be that kind of church. You know, we, we talked last week about a pretty difficult conversation inside the church, even outside of the church, because we talked about in this series, Nine Things That Matter. We're talking about things that matter through the letters that we're reading from uh, Paul to Timothy. First and Second Timothy are the books in the Bible. And in that last week, we talked about that women matter. The role of women in life in general and the role of women in church, that women matter. They matter to God. They matter in the church body. And, and, uh, and when we talked about that, we put a filter on of how we talk about these conversations when people have different views and different points of views. And, um, and the, the lens that we look through, all of these things, and especially today, comes right out of Matthew 22. And it's the way Jesus told us that we are to operate with one another and with him. 
There are all these laws in the Old Testament. There are all these rules and regulations, and Jesus came and he fulfilled them all. He didn't abolish them all. He fulfilled them all. And when he fulfilled them, he brought a new grace to cover us. And the apostle, or the, uh, the pro- those people, <laughs> I have to preach again, a very difficult topic. Um, when he was talking to the Pharisees that thought they had it right, challenged him and said, well, what's the most important thing, Jesus? If we have all these rules and laws, what's the most important thing? And he summed it up. He summed it up. Listen, this, is, this goes above all commands. If you live these two things, I says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's number one. If you get that right, everything else falls into place. If you love God with all of who you are. And then he says, and then the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love other people. That is Christianity in a whole. That is Jesus' message to us. Love God with all you got and love others with the love you've received. That's the picture. And so in this topic today, as we're talking about sex, sexuality, and even controversial type of things— We need to, as a church as a whole, look through the lens of love. No matter what, here at New Hope, we will love a person way before we will attack their problem. I heard one amen. Did you guys make that? Did you hear that? We here at New Hope will love the person, no matter what it is they've gone through. No matter whether I agree or disagree with their personal theology, right? Or whether I agree with their lifestyle or or whatever. No matter what, we receive and love the person way before we just start judging them for a problem that we see in their life. Okay, are we on the same page? All right, good, all right, all right. Hey, you guys are more alive than nine o'clock. Um, and we're going to have a little bit of fun today, but it's, it, this is a serious topic, so, so we're going to be very careful as we talk about these things, as we talk about sex and sexuality, okay? Because to, 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 to look at these passages we're going to look at in Timothy, um, th- it brings up two big topics, that are pretty hot topics in culture, and, and ones that church pastors usually don't talk about these. Um, and if they do, I don't think they do it. A lot of them, and I'm not saying everybody, just, just some don't do it with the right heart and, and with the right intention in Scripture. Okay, and so I'm going to do my best. You can be praying for me even as I preach. That today we are talking about that godly sexuality matters. Okay, that's what that's the thing that matters today that we're talking about. Godly and biblical sexuality matters. It's important for us to understand what God says about it. If we are Christians, if we are Christ followers and we're reading the scriptures, for us here at New Hope and and, and all Christ followers, the scriptures, the Bible, is the ultimate authority of truth. God has given us the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and enlightens the word of God as we read it. And as we see things, we walk in obedience to what God reveals to us through his word. And we change and grow more and more and more. And so we're going to be looking into God's word, his authority in our lives as Christians to to understand this topic and what does godly sexuality look like and and why does it matter and why is it so important and why is it, honestly, why is it all the way through the Bible? Like, it's all through the Old Testament, New Testament. We see truth wrapped around this specific topic and subject. Now, with these difficult verses and passages, last week we gave another layer, a lens, to look through as we deal with difficult passages that maybe we don't understand or things that we have our own opinion on. Because when we're talking about this, there's, there's plenty of opinion on sex and sexuality, right? Like, there's plenty in the culture, like any culture you're a part of, whether it's the United States or whether it's you're living in Asia or wherever it is. Every culture has a view and a cultural standard of what sex and sexuality looks like. And so you have this lens, this cultural lens, and then you have a personal lens, which is usually all of us have our own history or past or beliefs and experience wrapped around sex and sexuality. So we bring our own personal either hurts or wounds or, or goods and bads, and we formed our own view of what this looks like and, and what we think. And, and then now we add on God's view and the biblical view. And so I know we're all coming from different perspectives. And so that's why I need to say we're covering all of these with love. <laughs> That's why we accept each other. That's why we show grace to one another. But when we, and we study the scriptures, we have this filter that we have to look through. And this filter that we talked about last week is that we have to look at the context of a passage, meaning we don't take one verse, pull it out, and say, this is our doctrine. Like, we have to look at the context of where that verse is and how it fits into the whole passage that we are reading. That's in context, right? Culture. We can look at the culture that that was written to. Like, right now, we're talking about Paul to Timothy, In the city of Ephesus, there was a culture that existed in that time. 
And then we need to look for the topic consistency throughout the whole Bible. Like, so this is the topic this passage brings up. What does it mean in the context of what we're reading it? What was the culture? And then what is the topic throughout the, all of Scripture when it comes to this very topic? What is the consistent message throughout the Old Testament, New Testament about this thing? Okay? And then we also filter it through. Is this topic that, that we're learning, is it prescriptive? Meaning with this issue, is it always this way every time? Where are we prescribed as Christians to walk this out every single time, right? That's prescriptive. Or is it descriptive? Meaning, is it a description of what was happening and a way to live this out in our lives as Christ followers? Is it descriptive, right? Now, the, the verses that we're going to dig into, and I'm going to let Scripture talk a lot today, because this is a lot of what I'm talking about. It's not Tim's opinion, you know? Last week, we went, I, I preached both sides of views and point of views, even inside the church, of the role of women, and, uh, and I didn't give you an answer. <laughs> I said, so now wrestle with it, right? Like, like, we all have our own kind of wrestling with that because there were some descriptive, and there were some prescriptive things about that. This morning, all the passages that we're reading are direct. They're all very prescriptive. Like, this is, this is God's view, and this is, this is what he says over and over and over again to the consistency of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So the topic that we think culturally is very gray, actually we think there's 50 shades of it, um, <laughs> is very black and white. Like, like God is very black and white on this when we look at Scripture. And so that's what we're going to look at. So we can understand it, okay? So we can truly understand. And we can look at the heart of this God, this God of creation. This God who created sex and said it's good. And how do we understand it? And how do we live into it in today's culture? Now, now when we look at culture that we're talking about here with Paul writing to Timothy in Ephesus, I've already described the city in Ephesus. It's a wealthy city in this point in history. Uh, tourism was a big thing. It was like religious tourism. They had this temple, uh, the temple of Artemis, which was a goddess of fertility that people would travel from all over to come and they would worship this goddess so that they could be fertile and their families could be fertile and and attached to that, it was a sexually driven um, religion, meaning there would be, there would be temple prostitution and, and sex there in the temple uh, with this fertility god and the, god, the goddess herself, the imagery of this Artemis, and later it was called the, the, the goddess uh, Diana, like it's a picture of a woman with like lots of breasts all over her with a symbol of fertility. I mean, that's the imagery of what's happening in Ephesus with this temple worship and religion and now you have this Christian church, the gospel, that's growing in the midst of this culture. Um, I'm going to say, it's really not that different today. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. These things that we're talking about today were the same in the Old Testament, they're the same in the New Testament, the early church, and they're still the same today. The reality is this, sin is real, and this world is broken, and, uh, and the enemy wants to continue to break things that God created as good. And, and so when we think about that culture in Ephesus and we think about our culture today, welcome to America, one of the most over-sexualized cultures I think that's ever existed. And a lot of it's hidden underneath and it's, it's hidden eternal and, or internal and it's like personal stuff that we really don't talk about. You know, we, we kind of keep it like, well, that's them and that's them and we just like don't even talk about it. And, and that's the way it works inside the church too. Well, we just don't talk about those things and and we, 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 don't, we don't want to, you know, because that's pretty sensitive type stuff. And, and, but the reality is today is that sex sells, and it always has. That's why, <laughs> that's why Ephesus was a wealthy place, because they were all buying all the trinkets from the worship and the goddesses in, in this temple. And so that culture was rich because of sex, because sex was selling. It still does today. I mean, all the time. Commercials and commercialism and... and um, and what it does is it produces inside of a culture this unfulfilled, continual desire and need, right, that never goes away. You can sell to something that will never disappear, right? It's an unlimited resource. Lust is, right? Lust and, and, and the reality in our over-sexualized culture, you think about this issue, it's a bigger issue, is pornography. Um, like pornography, I, I, today it just, I, I feel for the teenagers that are growing up in today. Like, I think about when I was growing up, if you wanted to look at something, you had to either steal something from your uncle, you know, and find a magazine under his bed or something, or, or you had to get bold enough to go buy something 
and go to the store and be face to face with somebody in that process. And today, you have unlimited access within a few seconds on a mobile device you carry with you everywhere you go, and you can look at it whenever, even in the back of a classroom. And it's unlimited. I'm like, wow. Wow. How dangerous it has become. And how over just this prevalent th that issue is. And, and it's not just issues out in the culture. It's, these are issues inside the church, you know? Think about how many people inside the church are no different than the people outside of the church. <laughs> like, we're all people. That's the reality, you know? Like, even to the level of spiritual leaders that you think should be holy, and then you hear, well, so-and-so had an affair, and that pastor had an affair, and that pastor was doing this or that, and they got God, and it, it, it's sin. It's so prevalent everywhere we go. Now, in this over-sexualized culture we live in, we have something that swung to the very opposite end of the spectrum, which is we have an over-sexualized, but a culture that lacks the understanding of intimacy, of true relational closeness and intimacy. And so they're continuing to try to fulfill something that is actually fulfilled over here in an image that God has, and they will never actually have it because it's been cheapened to self-satisfaction, right? Um, welcome to the United States. Glad you're here. Um, so in this, in this imagery and in this culture that we're talking about, um, we, we see uh, Paul talking to Timothy, and in the first chapter, you can, you can go in your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, I have a lot of passages this morning. You can see on your notes there's a lot of scriptures because I'm going to let scripture speak the most uh, in, in this topic. But in this, uh, in this passage here in 1 Timothy, as we're starting, as Paul's talking, talking to this young pastor, Timothy's been wrestling with all sorts of stuff. I mean, we've been talking about false teachers and false teachings and doctrines coming to the church that aren't true and, and all sorts of issues happening. And, and he brings this one up, too, because it was real. Um, and, he, and he lists in this passage um, some things that, like, we're like, we would probably in this room be like, yeah, that's, that's probably wrong, and yeah, that's wrong. But there's other things culturally that you might look in this and be like, that's wrong? Like, it might be more like a question. Like, huh? How, how does this fit? And so when he's speaking to him, let's, let's jump into this passage that creates the conversation for today. This is what he says. This is what the scriptures say. He says, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels. Now let me stop there for a second, because the law, we think about the Old Testament law, was a bunch of do's and don'ts. Like it was don't do this, do that, don't do this, do that. It was, it was a, and there was a lot of them in the Old Testament. And the whole reason you have to put a law into place is because somebody's breaking it, right? That's what he's saying. It's like, the only reason you need rules is because you have rule breakers, and they're doing things they shouldn't, so now we've got to put a rule in place. And, and so he's saying that's the law in Scripture. He's like, that was put in place because there were those who were living out the opposite. And so we had to say, no, this is truth. This is the law, and this is how it works. And so it, was, it wasn't made for the righteous, but it was made for the lawbreakers, the rebels, the ungodly and sinful. Uh, the, the unholy, the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers. And so far, we're like, yeah, we don't like those people, right? Like, 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 I don't like murderers, especially those that kill their mom and dad. It's like, why did he list those separate? I think because there was these commandments called the Ten Commandments. It says, honor your father and mother. And it's the first one that comes with a promise that you can live long in the land. Like, God valued relationship with parents. But he's saying those that kill their parents, they just swung to the opposite direction of the law, right? They're like, we want to completely dishonor and kill them for murderers. And he keeps going. He says, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. And so we get into now He's talking about these things, the law that was created for those who were breaking it, those who were, those who were doing things that were against what God put into place. And he lists a bunch of things, right? The murderers, the, and then he says the slave traders, the liars, the perjurers. It's like any of these things are contrary to the sound doctrine, and he included in there sexually immoral and those practicing homosexuality. And now right away, I know there's those in the room, the moment I say this, because this one right here is a political and social justice issue in our culture today. And I'm not talking about this through the lens of political or social justice, okay? 
we're going to go back to the lens of what we talked about, that no matter what, welcome to new hope. Whether you struggle with trading slaves, which I don't think that happens, right? Like, um, or maybe you are the liar. Maybe that's your native tongue. Or whether you're a perjurer, you're trying to get things out of other people for your own benefit. Or He's saying all these are against God. Like God has a plan that's opposite of what these things are in people's lives. And so when we look at this, I need you to understand, especially this one, because in the room, I know there's all sorts of views. There may be, I don't, maybe not, but, but this one right here, God has a very clear black and white uh, issue with, okay? And now when we're talking about people, because some of you know people, individuals who are homosexuals, I'm just going to start with this conversation just to, 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 to loosen it up a little bit. We love people, period. I don't care what your history is. I don't care what your attraction is. I don't care what relationships are. We all have something on the list that we should not be doing. It's called sin. And so we're all blanketed under the grace of God. So I need to talk relationally very quickly that I don't want you to be angry towards me for the rest of the sermon because you have a specific view about one thing, okay? We love people no matter what. Okay, now that I got off my chest. Let's keep going into this topic because sexually immoral and practicing homosexuality are two really big red flag things in this conversation today. That there are things that are contrary to the sound doctrine. Meaning sound doctrine is that it's a foundational truth that God has put into place. And this foundation, these sound doctrines, these things go against God's sound doctrine. And this word here, the idea of sexual immorality, taking sex out of God's design is, is dangerous. It's probably the least talked about wounding and frustration in the culture inside the church. And, uh, and today we're just having the guts to have the conversation. Okay. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover everything today. We're already going to be here long, so get ready for that. Just hunker down and be with me, okay? Um, at some point, and we've already had conversations in our teaching team, that at some point, probably towards the end of winter, maybe into spring, we're going to do an entire series on singleness, on dating, on engagement, on marriage, on relationships. And this will be permeated all throughout those topics because it's a real part of all of those situations, okay? And so we'll go deeper into some of those bigger topics later on. And this conversation is kind of like the primer, maybe, for, for those conversations to come as we talk about this. But here's the foundation I want us to start at, okay? with things that are against sound doctrine. This is what it says. Every good thing God designed, Satan wants to distort. That's been from the very beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam and Eve. He created a perfect garden. And the very first thing he wanted to do was to distort it. The challenge was straight to identity, right? It was, it was straight to Eve, like, oh, God told you you can't eat from that tree? It's because he doesn't want you to be like him and he attacked identity. See, when we're talking about sex and sexuality, that's a big part of that conversation. Identity. And any good thing that God has created, and anything, Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to distort it so that it is lesser than God's picture and his design. See, when we see God as the God of creation, the God who, who put things together and he made everything, he spoke it into existence. And, and when we talk about good doctrine and theology, we're talking about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were present at the beginning, creating all things that we're a part of. Now, why can, I, why can I say that? Because Jesus said it. That's why I can say it. Some people look at the Old Testament in the book of Genesis and they're like, well, it's just a story, it's an analogy, it's not really how it happened. But we're going to look at Matthew, the book of Matthew, where Jesus is actually quoting Genesis. And I'm like, if Jesus is talking about Genesis, I should take notice, right? It means it probably was the right thing and it probably was truth. Not probably, it absolutely was truth because he was there. And so we look in this passage here in Matthew chapter 19, and, and Jesus is uh, responding to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the Pharisees who are trying to challenge him on divorce and marriage and all sorts of different things. And instead of getting tangled up into their conversation because he was, they were trying to trip him up and make it a messy thing, he goes back to the origins. He says, listen, all that messiness, all the things you're talking about, like when's it right to divorce and not divorce and blah, blah, blah. He's like, that's not even the issue. Let's go back to God's picture and his design. And he says this, he says, haven't you read, he replied, 
that at the beginning, this is Jesus speaking, at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, who? God has joined together. Let no one separate. Jesus is quoting Genesis to the original creation and saying, this is how God made us. And he's talking straight to the heart of gender, to marriage, to sex, and God's design and oneness. In just those few passages. This is a deep doctrine of the faith here. A deep doctrine for us as a church is that this picture is God's picture. His design and his desire from the very beginning. He made them male and female. Now, now, I'm talking about gender to start just a little bit, okay? Because right now we live in a culture where gender is fluid, right? It's a, it's a gender-fluid culture. And I need you as a church and us as individuals as Christians to not be one that points fingers and judges people who are struggling in that, okay? Because, because their struggle is real. They, they don't know what's going on inside of them. And there's, there's emotional, there's psychological, there's relational, there's all sorts of influences, on what's going on because the real question for that gender question that we're facing in culture today it doesn't have to do with physiology it has to do with emotional reality it has to do with identity they're struggling with the biggest question of all who am i and so when you wrestle and you meet people who are struggling with it, don't point fingers say uh, here's I, I know you might be struggling with it. here's what i know about jesus he loves you and he'll meet you in that story and as a Christ follower, I know their identity. If they walk into Christ, their identity is in Christ. It's not in their sexuality. Because the culture says your identity is your sexuality. Are you gay? Are you straight? Are you fluid on this line of gender? Who, who are you? And the reality is that is a lesser view of identity. Our identity is found in our creator, God himself, who made us. He, I'm preaching so much better than the first gathering. You guys are getting good stuff right here, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, First Gathering. Watch it online. Um, because here's, here's, the, here's the issue when I'm talking about this, is that God physically, physiology, there's either parts you have or parts you don't have. That is truth. That, that is how he made us, male and female. And when he designed male and female, he designed the parts to go together. This doesn't work, and this doesn't work. He made us to be one in flesh. And that, that oneness that he paints this picture, they're no longer two. Now let what God has joined together, God's design and creation, let no man separate. This is a big deal for us in the church. This is a big deal for me as I'm preaching. And I'm like, this matters. That we have this foundational view of who God is and how he has made us. Because that then is where our identity is found. See, what every good thing God designed, Satan wants to distort it. He, he, that's what he tries to do, to kill, steal, and destroy. See, Jesus, as he goes back to the order of things, he says he made a male and female, and it was good. And he made them for oneness, even sexually, you know, oneness. And God said, it's good. Sex is good, guys. Like, it's a good thing. God is a creative God that made it fun and made it good. But he also gave it purpose and boundaries for a reason because he knows us. God knows us. He knows you. And he knows the things that happen when we walk outside of his beautiful picture of sex and sexuality. The hurts, the pains that come along with that. I mean, it's kind of this imagery, and, and um, I'm just use this as an illustration. And it's kind of like if I, if I took, um, if I wanted to have like a, a piece of pottery made, and I found an artist that was just awesome at it. Like whatever they created, everybody was like, "That is beautiful! Wow!" And I said, "I want you to make for me a, a, a plate, a beautiful plate, this ornate, and I want to use it for display, and I want to use it on special occasions to bring that out." And, and, and to present to whoever I'm hanging around with and whoever I'm inviting over to our home, I want it to be awesome. And so I, I asked this artist, you be the creator, you make it. I'm not going to tell you how to, you create it. 
And then after he was done and, and glazed and it was perfect and it was protected and, uh, and he gave it to me and it had to be dishwasher safe, amen, right? And it's like, there's no way I'm hand washing this thing every time. And then so it's protected, right? Um, and, and, uh, and I say, thank you so much. This thing is beautiful. And everybody I show it to, isn't this beautiful? And, and then if I decided, well, I know he created it for a reason. He created it with a certain beauty, but uh, I forgot I don't have anything to scoop the poop from my dog in the backyard. And I took that instead. And I started scooping up messes with it. That's this image, guys. This is why sex is talking about in the Bible, because he had a creation, the creator. And Satan has taken it and turned it into something disgusting that creates brokenness. I want us to be in alignment with the creator who loves us and invites us into something healthy and good and loving and safe. The other part of this imagery that, God, that Jesus uses here is important to us as a church or to the church as a whole around the world because of this other imagery that's used all through the New Testament about Jesus and his relationship with the church. See, we see in different places throughout Scripture, like in 2 Corinthians 11, Ephesians chapter 5, the end of the story in Revelation 21 and 22, when Jesus comes back, all of it wraps to this imagery of Jesus as the groom and the church as the bride and sometime the groom is going to come to collect the bride and be with the bride the church and in that imagery that we see throughout the new testament this is a huge issue theologically that jesus is coming back that he is preparing his bride the church and he wants us to be a pure radiant thing so that we can be presented as the bride to this groom who has been waiting for us to now be one in the presence of Jesus for eternity. This deep theological understanding, when we talk about the imagery of marriage and oneness, matters for us in our theology. Because what it does is it elevates the view of marriage and oneness to the point of our relationship with our Savior. And that's, that's where it can get offensive uh, when people discredit marriage or, or talk about sexuality in a way that actually cheapens that even theological view of our relationship with our Savior. It can be harmful. Be harmful. Because that marriage in the end isn't going to be Jesus to Jesus. It's not going to be the church to the church. That marriage in the end is a groom to a bride who's been prepared and ready. So for us, that's that theological hold that we have on this imagery of man and woman being united as one and what God has joined together, let no one separate. No one separate. The church has a tradition of esteeming marriage and when weddings are done inside of a church, uh, it's in front of a lot of witnesses. It's a proclamation to them and to the God who loves them and there's a reason for that inside the church because that is what it is. It's highly esteemed. And it's highly important. So when we're talking about this idea of sexual immorality, okay, because now there's this distorted view. There's this view that the enemies kind of threw out there. And, um, and as he's done it, um, we see, we've seen it all, you see it all throughout the New Testament in the Old Testament. There's just a lot of messiness in the Bible, like just lots of it. And, um, and we see a continual message. I'm going to read a lot of scriptures in a moment, a lot of them. Um, I, actually, I'm, I'm reading four or five out of the 15 that I had so that you wouldn't have to stay here all afternoon, okay? Um, so just a few of this. And every time we see in the Greek in the New Testament this idea of sexual immorality or the sexual immoral, right? It is this word, this Greek word, perneia. Does, does that sound familiar? Right? This Greek word perneia in the New Testament uh, is translated. It means fornication or illicit sexual intercourse. And, and here's the list. It, it means anything outside of sexual activity, outside of the husband and wife relationship. It says adultery, uh, bestiality, which is sex with animals, right? Homosexual sex, incest within families, any sexual activity that's outside that marriage relationship. That is the word that is used all throughout the New Testament. And so when we see this word, it's not like it means it's here, something different here, something there. It's, it's consistent. When we're looking at God's view of this. And so this word porneia, you know, you recognize the word porn in it, right? <laughs> like, 
And so this, the, the, for us, this English word, we got pornography, graphy, which is the imagery, like images. And it, so it's us looking at images of porneia, of fornication or illicit sexual intercourse. It's us, that's, that's what that is. That's what pornography is. It's us enjoying others living out this in their life. And so it's attached to this as well. Um, so let's read a few passages and see what God says about it, okay? Um, and these are listed in your scriptures. I encourage you to go back and you can read them uh, throughout the week, uh, this week, and, and you can study this more. And we have some resources that I'll show you at the end here to help you in this. But this whole image, right, this whole image that I talk about with Jesus and the church and the image of God's creation, male and female, in Hebrews chapter 13, it says this, it is this imagery. It says, marriage should be honored by all. It should be lifted up. It should be raised up. It should be celebrated by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So God is the judge of everyone. That's just truth. And, and here he's saying, and God will judge those who live in this way, right? And the key, the key here is to understand that he's saying marriage should be honored, should be lifted up. What happens in the bedroom in that marriage should be honored, should be lifted up. They can celebrate that with each other. Anything outside of that goes against God's judgment. It's, it's against his word. Let's keep reading. I'm, I'm, the rest of these I'm going to read kind of quickly. Um, this is actually supposed to be Galatians 5.3. I, I didn't realize I put that down there. So it's Galatians 5.3. It says this. It says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the Christians. Because obviously there was, you know, inside the church. Uh, stuff was happening. He says, There shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed uh, because these are improper for God's holy people. So again, you see this. This is proper doctrine, and this is against God's doctrine. Read it. Read, read, and a little, der, der, der. Oh, no, the last one was Ephesians. Sorry. It's supposed to be Ephesians 5, 3. Ephesians 5, 3, if I put that wrong on your notes. This one is Galatians 5, 19, and it says this. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Let's talk about the word flesh for a moment, because flesh means more than just like flesh. It, it's talking about our sin nature. The acts of our own personal desires that are opposed to God's desires in our life. That's sin, right? It's like the acts of what we want and desire uh, are opposed to what the Holy Spirit, what God desires in our life. And these things that pull us away and pull us away from God's truth are continually trying to pull us away. That's the enemy's work in our life. Continually trying to tempt us to go this way, go this way, go this way. So this sin nature inside of us, it's the things that it produces are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, uh, debauchery, right? Which is just wild partying, you know? It's like idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, just wild sex parties, right? And the like. It's interesting. I don't know if you knew. Orgies are in the Bible. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That last sentence is a pretty heavy one, isn't it? And, and I need you to hear what's going on there, okay? Because if we live according to the flesh, we don't live according to the Spirit of God. Meaning, if we let our desires, our sin nature, our, our selfish desires in life be the ruler of our life, it means that Jesus is not in our life and Jesus is not the ruler of our life. And that's the imagery he's giving. He's like, those that live this way, what they've said is, God's good for you, but not for me. I'm following this. I'm following my sin nature. And, and he's saying unrepentant sin, a lifestyle that is continual sin and self-satisfaction, no matter what of this list it is, is against God. The moment it's repented of, I mean, the moment you say, I don't want this, and I turn 180 away from this to God, welcome to inheriting the kingdom of God. Do you hear the value? There's a different value in what we try to do to fulfill our flesh. If we value that, we'll experience the full value of it, which is limiting, it is broken, it is not fulfilling, it's not satisfying. And it, and it will separate you from God. The value of the kingdom of heaven, of God, that's everything. That's like good life now and forever. Like, 
That's the value of, of, of that relationship. I mean, the value of God, you, your value to God was Jesus. Meaning it cost Jesus, his son, so that he could be with you and you could be with him. That's how valued you are. So when he's given this picture that we want to inherit the kingdom of God, that's what he's saying. These things, the flesh, are obvious. They're going to lead you down a path. But when you're led by the Spirit and the kingdom of God is your destination, it elevates that value in your heart and life, which means I'm going to give up some things over here so that I can know that I can live with him over here. That's the gospel. That's what it costs. It's willing to take up your own cross and die to yourself so that Christ may live in you. That's good. We're going to wrap up this part with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can read that whole chapter this week if you want to. And uh, that would be the whole tape of my message this morning, that whole chapter. But here's just a few parts of it, okay? Because uh, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, which the church in Corinth was even more messed up than Ephesus. I mean, there was some crazy stuff, and it's crazy sexual stuff going on. Like, he had to talk to, specifically, uh, a, a, a son of a father who was celebrating that he was having sex with his father's wife, and the church was cool with it. I'm glad that's not happening here, all right? And I'm, I'm guessing that was, like, not his mom, because it, I think it would have said his mom, because that's a whole other issue. Um, so that, there's some struggle and stuff going on. So he just went to it. He said, this is, this is it right here. He said, or do you not know that wrongdoers uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God? So do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were to hear that. He's talking to all of them, saying to the church, that's who some of you were. Like, all of us struggle is what he's saying. Welcome to the doctor's office. Your appointment's soon. You know, like, like we're all broken. He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It costs Jesus for God to get you, is what he's saying. You were washed. You were like that. But you don't have to live like that. And then right in the very next part, um, he, he keeps going with the challenge. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Like, get, flee. Like, run. Get out of there. Like, when it's coming or temptation's there or, or, or that woman looks better than the one you've got, like, flee. You know, he's like, run away. Get out of there. And, I, and I'm saying that because I'm a man, but women, when that other guy looks more attractive than your husband, flee, okay? This is an equal right? Pornography is not a guy issue, by the way, especially in today's culture. This affects all of us. And, 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 uh, and he says, run away from it, flee from it. All other sins, this is, this is powerful, all other sins a person commits are outside the body. So like if, I'm, if I steal something, it's outside the body, right? If, 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 I, if I just have to steal something, if I steal somebody's car, and, and I go and I crash it, and they no longer have a car, and then I get caught, I'm going to do my jail time. But the thing is, they're going to get a new car, right? Something's going to be restored to them. And I'm going to do my time, I'm going to get out, I'm going to choose to not steal again. With this, with sexual sin, he's saying this is different. Because once you take it from somebody else, it can't be given back. It's already been taken. There's no replacement here. He says, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He goes deeper. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's a pretty compelling argument, isn't it? I'm talking to the Christians in the room. If you're not a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit's not in you yet, okay? But if you are a Christ follower in this room, you have now been and become the temple, the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you. That thing that generations in the past, all through the Old Testament, desired to be close in relationship with God, and they had to build a temple. God's presence had to be in that temple, and only a few could go into it. All of that in the Old Testament, Jesus, when he died, he tore that veil of the temple, and he gave us the Holy Spirit inside of us. Now we 
are the temple in which the Holy Spirit, God's presence himself, dwells? He's like, treat this as the temple that God made it. Now, I know my temple's got some issues. It's got a little something here. It's got a little something extra here, right? Like, these aren't perfect temples, but the reality is they're made perfect by Jesus. He is in us. And so honor this. Honor our bodies as it indwells the presence of God himself. Honor God with your bodies, he says. See, there is no confusion in Scripture. There's no gray. There's black and white. God's design is sex inside of a marriage with a husband and wife that is pure and holy. Anything else outside of that is outside of God's will for your sex and sexuality. That's it. Those are the lines. See, God created, and you can fill in the blank here, God created sex to be the safest and most intimate part of marriage. That's what he created it as, the safest and most intimate. We live in an intimate, uh, how do I say, an intimacy-deprived culture. Like, people don't know how to be known and truly know others, just even in friendships. Like, it's hard. And inside a marriage, I don't know how many marriages lack a closeness and a oneness and intimacy because of brokenness or distrust or, or, and we're talking about sexuality, like broken promises to one another. See, this imagery, this safe, intimate place, it's the place where you get to be totally known. It's the only special place where you're absolutely intimate and 100% vulnerable on all fronts, physically, emotionally, relationally, it's, it's that special place where you should feel cherished and loved and, and you know how to learn how to cherish and love your spouse, where you feel the most fulfillment and connection in that relationship. It's that space where you learn how to give and receive and understand how it operates selflessly to please one another. It's not about your own pleasure. It's about oneness with your spouse. I'm telling you, it's the best 12 minutes of the day. And for some of you, it might be of the week, it might be of the month. It depends how busy life is, right? Like, and for you, it might be longer or shorter. I don't know. But here's what I'm saying. Inside a marriage, it's beautiful. And it's enjoyable. And it should be all that God created it to be inside that marriage and that relationship. Okay? We can have fun, just so you know. Now, outside of marriage, I'm just going to talk about very, very specific things now, Okay? And I'm going to do my best to, to use my time well because I could do a whole sermon on every single one of these. So I'm just, I'm just going to share with you very quickly because this whole idea of premarital sex, um, again, there's nothing new under the sun. When I grew up in high school, everybody was having sex. And I went to a Christian school, by the way, Christian high school. And, uh, and it still was happening. It was like people were hooking up with each other and they'd have conversations. Well, who did you hook up with this weekend? And it was just kind of a norm and it's always been a norm. I mean, you go back to the 50s, 60s, whatever. Like this whole idea of having sex before you're married, before marriage is even, even hits your life. Um, see, there's, there's, there's a reason why God said, let the marriage bed be kept sacred. sacred because um, any time that you have sex outside of that, even before marriage, you've now created something in your own life, in your own um, soul. And, and you've created an atmosphere where now comparison is going to exist once you finally get to that wedding day. Because now you're going to remember so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and well, she's not as good or he's not as good as whenever I did it, da 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 and so you've already created dysfunction before you've even ever been one with the woman or the man that you've chosen to be with forever. It gets dangerous, and, and it, creates, it creates a pattern, and it can create a pattern of distrust in future relationships. Because if you go into a marriage and they know that you've had this pattern, and each dating relationship you've slept with that person and you've slept with that person, when it finally gets to that moment of marriage— now that you're married, what's going to stop you from thinking about somebody else the way you did in that pattern over and over and over again before you said yes? So you can create yourself distrust in that relationship because they'll be wondering, am I still good enough here? And so you lose intimacy when somebody's worrying and doesn't have trust in that relationship. It can create a pattern of disloyalty, and, and I already said it earlier, 
once you give it to somebody, you'll never get it back. Never get it back. So, so premarital sex can lead to all sorts of things. And I, and I believe it's God's design to wait. To wait. I know my wife and I, we, we chose that when we were in high school. There was this movement when I was in youth group growing up called, um, called uh, for, I have to remember what it was called because I have so much in my head. It was a True Love Waits. I don't know if you've ever heard of that program back in the day. True Love Waits. And it was a proclamation as a teenager saying, I'm going to wait to have sex until I'm married. Because I believe that my love for that person is going to supersede my desire and my hormones when I'm a teenager now. Because our hormones, when you're a teenager, is all messed up, right? Things are happening in your bodies. You're curious about things. And so often, you're not allowed to talk to anybody about it. I hope in your families, talk about sex with your kids often. You're like, that's weird. Why? Because they're thinking about it often. So the more you give them truth, the more you help them understand Here's why, not just don't do that, don't do that. Like, tell them why. Here's why. God wants more for you, right? And so, if, like, f- for us and for me to make that decision when I was a teenager, say, I will not have sex before I'm married. What I was saying is, I'm going to cherish my wife before she's my wife. I'm not going to have a pre affair on her. She's going to be mine, and my one and only. And again, you go back to the imagery of Jesus as the groom and the church as the bride. He doesn't want the church to be having affairs with other idols in our lives. That's what the Old Testament, that's what the Israelites were doing to God all the time. And, and God was saying, I'm jealous for you. I want a relationship with you, but you keep wandering away from me, worshiping all these idols from these other gods. It's as if you're prostituting yourself to things lesser than me. So we see this imagery. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you're not married, keep your pants on. It's okay to kiss. It's okay to show affection, right? But and some people are like, well, where's the line? I mean, is oral sex okay? And, and I say, no. How, how intimate do you want to be with somebody? I'm telling you, I don't want to have any regrets when I'm married that I have any comparison sexually with anybody else before that. Okay? So save yourself and love your future spouse more than you love your own desire. That shows something about your character and your love for God and the kingdom of heaven is what it does. And that means the woman or the man that you marry gets an opportunity to love you all the more. Okay? So wait. Adultery. This one is one of the messiest ones. Because once you're married and all of a sudden somebody has an affair, somebody has multiple affairs, we all know what happens. I mean, trust is eroded in that relationship immediately. How dare you? Um, in that family, just, you know, sin never just affects us. It always affects those closest to us, no matter what the sin is. And tr- distrust and disloyalty in that family, and now confusion on how do we relate with each other, and how do, how do we operate. Like, a- adultery it creates so many wounds and severs intimacy in, in so many relationships with people that go way beyond that specific relationship, right? And then filters out into all the other relationships they have with friendships, or fill in the blank. He's like, just don't do it. Flee. Run away. Because the other side is not what God desired and desires for you. Pornography. Pornography today is the prevalent sin, right? Uh, Pornography and self-satisfaction and masturbation. Like, the the reality, what this creates inside of anybody is an um, an unfulfillment. I mean, there's, there's a desire and a lust that can never go away and so there's this unquenchable lust that creates an addiction and becomes a lifestyle to where now we know that a whole generation can't live without it. I don't know how many teenagers operate on a daily basis where they view it because they have access to it on their phones at any second, right? Like, I would encourage you parents, what's on your kids' phones? Our, our kids' phones are locked out, and, and, it's, and it's locked out for a reason because I believe the enemy wants to use whatever he can and trust me, the culture is very prevailing. They'll use whatever they can, even in an in- innocent Google search. You can't search anything on Google without seeing boobs. Like, I'm like, come on. Because that's the enemy's distortion of God's beauty. So I'm just saying, be careful, because what this creates in you is an unquenchable desire for something that will never have an end. It creates in people a, a, a drug addiction-like response. Actually, they've done studies on what happens during this process in self-satisfaction, that inside the brain, it's the same chemicals that start firing on all synapses in your brain as those that when somebody takes a hit of a certain drug, 
It's like, ha, ha, ha. It's like a high. And so, of course, you want to go back to it because in that high, you forget all the problems of your life and your day. And, and it's dangerous. If you're addicted, we want to help you get free because it'll be unquenchable and it will not create to anything in the intimacy that God desires for your life. Singleness. Now, I couldn't talk about this without talking about singleness because we have a lot of people who are single. We have divorced people in the church. We have those that haven't been married and, and maybe won't get married. And I need you to know that God speaks into this singleness. And, and the thing that he speaks to is, is celibacy. It's a, it's a choice to not pursue your desires in the flesh and, and in your sexuality and instead finding your identity in Christ. And, and using your energy appropriately. Actually, like Paul talks about this, and uh, he's talking about, it, uh, about marriage and stuff, and he suggests that uh, that's probably better for you to not get married because there's a lot of problems inside of marriage. I mean, I don't know if you, any of you have the perfect marriage. Uh, it was really quiet right there. All right, so, so here's what I know. Marriage is hard. And he says that if you're going to be married, that means you're going to have to give your attention to that individual, rightly so, which means that it's going to steal from your attention from your relationship with God, and now you're going to be distracted in your relationships. He says, it's probably better to be single. You can focus your heart on God, not be distracted by the busyness and the relationships in this world. It's like, focus your energy and relationship on God. Jesus actually said it this way um, it, because the disciples were around and they were, again, talking about divorce and remarriage and, and, and Jesus is teaching and, and they get to the point where the disciples turn and say, man, if this is the case, it's better to not get married. <laughs> and, like, th- and that's based on what Jesus was talking about. And, uh, <laughs> and then Jesus says, well, there are some who were born eunuchs. And a eunuch was somebody who was a male who was castrated, meaning they couldn't have a sexual life at all. He said some were born that way, some were made that way by somebody else, and some have chosen to live like that in order they may focus on the kingdom of heaven. See, even Jesus saying there's, there is no heterosexual gospel and a singleness gospel and a homosexual gospel like the, none of that exists our identity isn't in our gender or sexuality it's in Christ alone is what he was saying and so in your singleness honor God let him be the one that rules in your heart in in that season of singleness and then the last one which is the most complicated one in our culture because this one is the political it's a social justice it's there's a lot of issues when we talk about this one but when we look at scripture it's very clear homosexual sex the physical act male to male, female to female, is against God's design in sex. And, and, and with this picture, um, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about this just for time's sake. When, when people struggle with this, and I've studied this for probably like four or five years. I've been in conversations with pastors. I've met with different counselors. I've, I've talked to um, people who are professionals in the area of helping people who struggle with same-sex attraction. Because that, that desire to be attracted to somebody of the same sex is, is not one that is just out there. It's in here. Like, there are good, godly Christian people who have grown up and they've known no different than this desire they have and they don't know what to do with it. Because they've seen the church in the past has been homosexuality is wrong and if you're that, you're going to hell, right? It's been a judgmental, so they can't even talk about this internal struggle. Like, but that's who I'm attracted to? What do I do with this? I think the church should be an open place for people to talk about that. To say, this is real, and this is where I'm at, and I don't know what to do with it. And, 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 and the idea, you know, and there's been many here at New Hope who have struggled with that, and I've had conversations with people. I've been to counseling, and, and, um, and some of them have chosen, I want to honor God with my sexuality, which means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die to myself. I'm going to pick up my cross, which means I'm probably not going to have a family. I'm probably not going to be married or be satisfied in, in that realm. But that, letting that go, is temporary to what I get to experience forever with my Heavenly Father. I'm willing to set that aside, even though I'm going to struggle with it the rest of my life. There's a God-honoring way to wrestle with that. And, and I've seen it. And I've talked to people who struggle with it. And, and I need you to know, and I keep echoing this, we respond with love no matter what here matter what. And even those who are practicing homosexuality, we are going to show them love. In Romans chapter 1, we we see this. 
this imagery, and again, I, there is no gray here. Like, this is, this, is, this is what God says. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Again, going back to this idea, God's creator, who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. He handed them to, over to them. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. He's given that picture. Here's God's design, and here's what's unnatural to God's design and desire. He says, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. It's clear. Like, I, I, I can't, like, look at the culture or think politically or whatever. Like, when I see God's design, this whole idea of homosexual sex is against God's design. That doesn't mean we hate. It means we love people no matter what. Because right in the very next chapter, as he continues to talk about this, and that wasn't the only topic in Romans chapter 1, by the way. There were lots of other things people were struggling with. A lot of things inside the church. But he goes to this, and in, the, in that same vein of thought, he says, you therefore have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now know, uh, uh, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. I mean, God, God's the perfect judge. He knows the heart. He knows the life. He knows everything. We don't. And they're saying like, you, us, are all sinners. We are all perverted in the eye of God. There's something off about us because sin has entered into this broken world. He says, no matter what sin you have, if you judge your sin less than their sin, you're out of alignment with God. All of our sin separates us from God. And he says, so for you to be judging other people for their sin is for you to put yourself in the seat of God, which you can't be, because we're not holy perfect, and we're not good judges. We only look at external things through our filter of brokenness and hurt and wounds and pain and history. So he's challenging them. He, he, he keeps saying, so when you, a mere human being, uh, human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches? Listen to this character of God here. Listen to it carefully. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, his forbearance, his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? God is a kind God. He meets us wherever we're at in our story. And that's why we say everyone deserves equal love. Everybody deserves God's presence. Everybody can come to the foot of the cross. It's a pretty flat place, equal opportunity. No matter who you are, what you've done, and where you've been. See, if we get truth right, but we don't love right, then we're not right. It's got to be both. It's got to be both. So how do we treat people who have been adulterers? How do we treat people who have an addiction to pornography? How do we treat people who are struggling with same-sex attraction? People who are living in homosexual relationships? How do we treat these people? Love. Everybody say that word with me. One, two, three. Love, not judgment, is what Romans chapter 2 is saying. We're not the judges. We can meet people in their journey. I will tell you, here at New Hope, we will be about the person way before we're going to be about their problem. And so we're going to meet everybody where they're at. Now, I know in this room, in this topic, there's all sorts of hurts and wounds. Some that have never been spoken of. Some that God has already maybe brought some healing in some of your lives. Uh, in your sex, sexuality some that you're still living in something that you know is wrong and off and the Holy Spirit's been trying to get your attention and I, and I want you to know <laughs> that you're in the waiting room to the great physician the doctor that's calling you in and he wants
wants to meet you. And he wants to love you. And he wants to bring you to the other side of it. Sexual woundedness is probably one of the most experienced and least talked about issues in the church today. People who feel used, abused, confused, or shamed. The enemy wants you to keep quiet. He wants you to suppress what's really going on inside of you. And I'm telling you, the moment you bring it to light and the moment you bring it to Jesus is the moment freedom forgiveness starts and healing can begin. And so I would encourage you, don't waste today and don't waste this moment that we're going to take in just, in just a minute to let the Holy Spirit work in you in this. God, thank you for your word. Thank, thank you that you haven't hidden anything. There's nothing in your word <laughs> that you've hidden. It's all there. Your truth, your love, your perfect judgment, and yet your kindness that leads us to repentance. So often we try to wrap our own hearts and minds around these things, and it's difficult. It's difficult because of our own sinfulness and our own hurts and our own past and even our own guilt from, from past decisions. It's difficult for us. I'm going to pray by the power of your Spirit this morning, God, that each of us in this room would let you poke and prod into the depths of our heart. Just as a loving Father who wants to bring healing, we know you're not poking and prodding to hurt or to, 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 to bring us more pain. You, you want to bring us healing. And so I pray in this time, as we're going to take a time to respond, that you would work in this moment here. I'm just asking you, Holy Spirit, to do that.